welcome you all here tonight. There will probably be extra people popping in, which is fine. They can join us when they join us. And uh, first off, I'm coming to you uh, from the home office of Chief Capes in the beautiful South Surrey here. And I want to acknowledge with respect that it is an honor to live, work, and play in the traditional ceded and unceded territories of the Semiamu, Capesi, Kwaikwitlam, Kwatlin, Kikipite, and Tawasin First Nations. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Karen Klein, founder of Sheathscapes, a community that I've created to build women's confidence, bravery, vulnerability, all that good stuff. Uh, we started out as being a girls getaway, but COVID hit. We're not going anywhere, but we're right here today sharing some stories. So uh, today is National Tell a Story Day. So real timely that we're actually doing this. So we're really excited about that. Storytelling is such a powerful and a wonderful tool. It's one of the most powerful means that we have to influence, teach, and inspire. Storytelling forges connections among people and between people and ideas. Stories also convey the culture, history, and values that can unite us all. It's what we've lost during this pandemic, wouldn't you agree? Storytelling, connecting, um, you know, the ability to connect and share our stories with other, it's what we used to do at social gatherings. We would laugh, we would cry, we would reminisce, we would hug, we would dance, we would sing, we would tell stories. So tonight, we're going to tell some stories. We've got eight beautiful women here tonight telling some great stories. Round of applause for them. And the purpose of our time together tonight, you guys, is to inspire, to uplift, to support, validate, connect and so much more all through stories. We hope that some of the stories that you hear tonight resonate deeply with you and even ignite the process of reconnecting you to that deeper, truer part of you. So that, you, could I say you anymore? Because it's all about you. Um, you. We wanna set you up in a way that you feel validated, you feel great, you feel awesome, and that you can move forward in a more positive, balanced, and abundant future. All we ask of you tonight, now, you guys are coming from us live from three different places, and all we ask of you tonight is that you listen to each story with an open, non-judgmental, and respectful heart. It takes a tremendous amount of courage to let your voice be heard and share a vulnerable story with the world. And I want to uh, really thank these women for making this happen for me. It's really them that's making it happen for She Faith because they uh, said, absolutely, I want to tell my story. We all have stories. So thank you so much for being brave, for being here today and for sharing your stories. Now, a little housekeeping. For those of you that are coming in from Zoom, uh, we okay, a little housekeeping here. We encourage you to grab yourself your favorite beverage or a warm cup of tea, coffee. I hope you're cozy, a nice undistracted space, and just get cozy. If you're joining us via Zoom, please keep your cameras on. I know it sounds odd, but if you can, please keep your cameras on so the speakers can see your beautiful faces. However, that being said, be very aware of what you're doing though, um, because it can become distracting, but be aware of what you're doing. But the reason why we like your cameras to be on is because the speakers are gonna feed off your visual energy in the same way they would if this was a live in-person event. So they wanna see you, they wanna see you smile, they wanna see you get excited, they wanna see you, you know, they wanna see your body language. If for some reason you have to do something that you think might be distractive, you can go ahead and, and turn your camera off, no problem. Um, so if your full attention is appreciated. And if we can also just make sure we remember to keep our microphones muted. Karen, for can I interrupt for a quick second? Yeah. So, so sorry, when I switched over um, to make you host, we lost the live feed in the group. Yeah. Uh, we'll just probably have to connect to that again. Well, hang tight, you guys. Let's just uh, connect. They are going to 
you know what? It's asking me to sign in. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to make you the host again. So okay. Can, uh, um, I'd also say, Karen, as we get started here, everyone's on mute. But uh, as a speaker has done a couple of these virtual events, one of the uh, kind of strange parts of it was when you're done your your little yeah. talk and it's just silent. So. Yeah. I would encourage you at the end of everyone's talk, just quickly unmute and just like give a vocal Absolutely. round of applause. It yeah. just feels nicer on Absolutely. the other end of it. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Becky. So um, yeah, and thanks, Melody, for pointing that out. So I put you back on host. So hopefully you can get Facebook back up and ready. Um, so for so going back to if you're on Zoom for the best viewing experience, on the top right corner is actually your view. And you have a choice of gallery view or speaker view. I recommend speaker view. So then when you see each speaker, you're gonna see them full screen, which is it's gonna be the best. Um, there won't be a QA and a session per se, but if something touches you, if something really resonates with you, please feel free in whatever platform you're watching from to show your gratitude to the speakers, leave a comment, send them a lovey heart, send them some emojis, Let's really, really cheer them on. This talk series was designed for all of you, and we hope that you enjoy it as much as we do. So first up, we have the beautiful Rachel Menares. Rachel is a career explorer, busy wife, and doting mom who refuses to grow up. Rachel, I don't blame you. And <laughs> loves change and adventure. Her favorite things are traveling when we can, and her dogs, and her Spotify playlists. In this series, she will talk about coming undone and how she's grown from it. With her talk, she's come undone. Help me introduce Rachel. Thanks, Karen. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, everyone. When you hear the word undone, how does it make you feel? uncomfortable, uneasy, afraid, unsure. Interestingly, she's come undone is a popular conjuring in brains everywhere. Like somehow undone is reserved for women. Does the old song by the guess who pop into your mind? The one that includes the words, it was too late. By definition, the word undone means not tied or fastened and also not done or finished. My name is Rachel. I was done. Multiple times over. The highlight reel of my life goes a little like this. I married a mysterious, charismatic, deeply flawed man and had two beautiful daughters with him. It looked as though I had a life designed to be a mother and a wife. I abandoned the notions that career and work should come in first, and I threw myself into what I thought was this sparkly life of domesticity. On the outside, it looked like I had it all. Beautiful family, doting husband, new house, surrounded by a tribe of friends and family. Life looked perfect. I coasted through thinking this is it. I have actually made it. I moved mountains to ensure that all the plates were spinning all the time. I served everyone and continuously and relentlessly put myself in last place on the priority list. I worked ridiculously hard to be the perfect mom, wife, daughter, friend, all while holding down a full-time job. The list goes on and on. Then the unthinkable happened in August of 2004. It was inconceivable to me that I was blind to the fact that my husband at the time was engaging in multiple extramarital affairs and had been for many years. Without going into too much detail, he went to work one evening and metaphorically, he never returned. Well, he did and everything fell apart within a few hours. He packed a bag and removed himself from our home at my request. He was gone. Everything changed in an instant. I believe that this was the first inkling that I had that somehow I needed to come undone, but I didn't. It wasn't time yet. 
I suppose I resisted, clung to my old mindsets, and overnight I flipped into survival overdrive. Alone, afraid, saddled in the debt of a new house, fiercely protecting my daughters, I was suddenly a single parent. 60 pounds lighter, and sadly, I lost more than a few friends. I was the master of disguise, and nobody really knew that I was struggling. To everyone, I looked like a new, strong, vivacious, slim powerhouse. I bought a few new dresses, smoothed my hair, took a deep breath, and plunged back into the dating pool. Miraculously, I met kind, wickedly handsome, generous, and loving Chris. I looked sparkly, but I was broken, battered, bruised, still licking my wounds, and it began again. A whirlwind romance ensued. I was engaged after two months. I hastily filed for divorce and once again, tucked myself neatly into the little box of what appeared to be a fairy tale life. As I write this, it's really interesting to me that the story started with my personal life and that my first inclination was not to discuss my educational background or my career. Perhaps it's because even though I thought it mattered, it was never first in my mind or anywhere even close to it. I grew up wanting to become, in this order, a flight attendant, a hairdresser, a nurse, and a midwife. Diverse, I know. I ended up with a diploma in office administration with a medical specialty, and that was enough. I was enough. December 30th, 2007, I married Chris. I married an incredible father and stepfather. He loved my scars. He loved my daughters. He loved me in a way that I had never known. And as Shirley Valentine said, he kissed my stretch marks. We made forever promises and overnight I became a mom to four children. Chris had two boys from a previous marriage. Once again, my life looked like a storybook. It was all very Hollywood. We were the reduced version of the Brady Bunch and we were reminded of this by everyone. I was suddenly Mother Goose with a gaggle of little ones behind her. We moved to our home in quaint Steveston Village and after I bounced around a little while, I landed a great job in the school district. I fit myself neatly into the well-established mold of school secretary extraordinaire. I made new friends, I loved my house. I worked so hard to uphold the image of the perfect wife, perfect mom, perfect stepmom, and the list goes on. I was done. Lots happened in the in-between years, but I only have eight minutes here. 2020 arrived and COVID hit. Our youngest girl suddenly found herself without a job that was about to begin and being an artist looked for some projects to keep herself busy. A YouTube video, hauling out a bin of fabric, dusting our sewing machine and ironing board, we made a mask. Be assured, I was no expert seamstress. I barely scraped through home economics in high school. I made a few lackluster garments, but I mostly supported the kids through their own sewing projects. And that was it. I posted a photo on Facebook of that first mask. Clearly it needed refining, but at the time folks were scrambling to mask up. One order turned to 30 orders, turned to 100 orders. Poster boards to track production went up in our dining room, the epicenter of our operations. Spotify playlists were on repeat. We called in help, and when I wasn't working, I was sewing or driving around to find elastic and more fabric. Flash forward one year later, we have made over 3,500 masks. We worked really hard to keep up, and for each one we sold, we donated one. I now have arthritis in my two pushing fabric fingers. I posted really pretty updates and photos on social media and inspired everybody around me. I found random gifts in our pickup basket outside my front door almost daily. I was exhausted, constantly pushing to fill orders while maintaining some semblance of order in my life. I sewed, I parented, I wifed, I did everything. I made the decision to take a leave of absence from my job in a very busy elementary school. Feeling uneasy about COVID situation and the fact that my husband with an autoimmune disease could be in grave danger due to my work exposure, 
I hit the sewing machine hard. I think my soul knew that creating something was slowly healing me. Something beautiful happened this year, even though I cried. In fact, I sobbed and I gritted my teeth and I was afraid, but I pushed against it. I daily coasted through the emotions of being unsure and unsettled. For the first time, I didn't know what next week, next month, next year looked like. I knew that I needed to push through this. I needed to create. Friends, family, and strangers around the globe had a small sense of security wearing our creations. We did really good by donating. We created an income stream in a really difficult time. Today, the masks have slowed down. I think we were amongst the first to start making them, and now they're available almost everywhere. We shifted over the course of the pandemic with softer elastics, adjuster beads, three ply, various fabrics. But here's where the magic happened. I finally came undone. I untied all of those proverbial shoelaces that while seemingly held my life in place, were binding me in a position that I had clearly outgrown. I was thrust into unknown and really uncomfortable territory. I needed, and I was forced to adjust my sales. I had spent my entire life living up to expectations, mostly created by myself. Ultimately, I stopped basing my opinions of me on what I was to everyone else. A little fire was growing from a really small spark that told me that I actually need to learn myself after this brief glimpse into my own potential. In February, I had a total hysterectomy. I took it like a champ. The new me allowed myself to move past some inevitable, sad and unpleasant emotions. And I quickly created a space for acceptance. I listened to the song Brave by the incredible Sarah Bareilles on repeat and the little voice inside my head now says to me how big your brave is. My daughters are grown up now. They're spreading their wings and almost ready to fly away. Coming undone has given me the rare gift of letting go of my previous need for control, unreasonable expectations, blame, guilt, fear, the list goes on. Another beautiful result of my transformation has been the opportunity to demonstrate and inspire my two young women to do the same thing. This pandemic has impacted my marriage in ways I could never have anticipated. My undoing has allowed me to grow within this relationship in authentic, vocal, and unafraid way. Releasing my old ways of being and mindsets has allowed me to move forward in a way that doesn't allow me to focus so much on the outcome, but more of my own journey. Come what may, I know that I'm living true to myself. My mom always told me that the women in our family are strong. I was emphatically informed by a therapist to hit pause on the strength narrative. I have now chosen some new words for myself, brave, growing, and resilient. I'm moving past the mask empire. I have embarked on a super exciting new career change. It's so far from what I was doing before that my head spins on the daily. And for the first time ever, I don't have a very clear vision of my future. What I do know is this, I am becoming less afraid, less hesitant, less quiet. I have realized finally that my staying small doesn't serve anyone, most importantly, myself. Coming Undone has allowed me to finally throw the reins over my life instead of merely letting life happen to me. I am in control of my own destiny. Am I still unsure at times? Absolutely. Do I feel utterly untethered at times? Of course. Am I exempt from all previous emotions and mindsets all the time? Definitely not. Stay tuned and watch out. At age 49, I am a force to be reckoned with. 
I have more stories to be told and I have really strong wings to fly. I will never try to tie those shoelaces again or to fit myself into any mold or mindset. I choose gloriously undone. I am inspired by myself. I'm a storyteller. It was never too late. Thank you. Rachel, that was beautiful. Unmute and give her some love, you guys. You were Thank worried you. about going first, Rachel. Rachel. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. Oh, that Thank was you. So good, Rachel. Oh. There you go. Woo, woo, woo. Okay, you guys, um, if we can just mute ourselves again. Rachel, that was amazing. I Thank am you. sorry for the glitches. I got kicked off the computer zoom and um i've heard rachel's story though i know it's beautiful but i am back on through my phone so we shouldn't have any more problems rachel i love how you um just realized that you had to learn how to sit in the feelings and accept that feeling of coming undone to help you reshape that old you know that thought of what you should be and how you should be and what an amazing role model you are for your daughters. Like, it's incredible. And I love the new words that you've chosen, brave, growing, um, and uh, oh, what's the last one? I can't even read my writing here. Brave, yeah. growing. Resilient. Resilient. Thank you, Karen. Amazing. I loved it. And I know that this is a topic that other people struggle with. Um, I really hope that Rachel's touched you in some way. There is going to be ways that we can connect with our speakers after as well. And I will post that on social. So thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. So next up, we have Karen Treneman. Karen is a restless and adventurous spirit with a lifelong passion to explore all cultures, both at home and abroad. She's passionate about fitness, nutrition, leaving and leaving as light of a footprint as possible as she has great concerns about the environment. Mega multitasking Karen is a full-time ICBC road safety coordinator and a single mom. She and her son, Lucan, love learning about Asian languages, history, culture, and food, especially when it inspires Lucan to create his culinary works of art. She has a variety of delicious and beautiful evidence that Lucan is a future chef or anime artist. Karen's also a recent graduate of the Food Matters Nutrition Certification Program, and in addition to road safety, is passionate about educating people on how to use delectable food as medicine and live their best, longest, and healthiest lives. With her talk, My Gut Instinct, that small, insistent voice, here is Karen Treneman. Thank you, Karen. I was 19 when I met Michael at Simon Fraser University. We were criminology students. He was fourth year, I was second. And our connection had all the spine tingling, butterflies in your stomach thrilling electrically charged fireworks that I'd read about in romance novels. It overwhelmed both of us. Within five months, we rented an apartment near Central Park in Burnaby and told our respective parents that we had found the one. A year and a half later, Michael got down on one knee in Central Park and presented me with this beautifully cut three quarter carat diamond ring. And less than two years after that, we were married in Nassau, Bahamas with close family members in attendance. It was a dream come true. The problem was, that wasn't my dream. Some girls grow up and imagine their future husband and decide how many kids they'd like to have and think about their names. I was not that girl. <laughs> I dreamed about traveling around the world and exploring new cultures. And I was stressed about the idea of overpopulation and images of starving children. When Michael proposed to me in Central Park, my inner voice said, this isn't right for you. 
and I ignored my voice. And when we were married in the Bahamas, my inner voice said, this won't make you happy. And I ignored my voice again. Um, <laughs> sorry. Oh, uh, three and a half years after our wedding, uh, Michael and I bought a little house in New Westminster near Queen's Park. And my inner voice said, this is wrong. You shouldn't do that. And I told myself to adapt and grow up. When we traveled, my inner voice was quiet because that at least aligned with my values. And so backpacking trips around Europe and exploring India with sick friends became the glue that held our marriage together for a while. I knew our marriage was over in November 2005 because we were talking about our Southeast Asia trip in February and March 2006. And I realized I didn't want to go. And so I left my best friend, biggest fan, dearest love, and I rented an apartment in White Rock and I spent 2006 running on the beach asking myself, what the hell do you want? September 2007. I was at London Metropolitan University in England starting a master's degree and my inner voice was cheering because I was finally on my path. <laughs> that year and a half I lived in London, I saw opportunities to fulfill dreams everywhere. Long held dreams, half baked dreams, cherished dreams, random yesterday's dream, everything just clicked. I felt like the universe had been waiting for me to arrive. In May 2008, I had an epiphany that thrilled and amazed me, but at the same time, deep down, it didn't surprise me. For the first time in my life, I wanted to be a mom, and I knew I would try to achieve that through international adoption. Because the first image that flashed through my mind was me at 12, stressed about overpopulation and starving children, saying, If I ever want to be a mother, I'm going to adopt. The adoption road was hard and scary. There was no guaranteed outcome. I knew I could end up broken and miserable. People said I was so brave. I didn't feel brave. I felt compelled. My inner voice kept saying, you have to go down this road. Whatever happens in the end, you need to do this. <laughs> and I trusted that voice. And I followed it without question. <laughs> and I was lucky. In June 2010, my mom's sister and I arrived at an orphanage in Vietnam, and there I met a baby boy of whom I had seen two photos. And as I wrote in a magazine article a few years later, I knew from the moment I held him that I was embarking upon the grandest and most meaningful adventure of my life. Almost 11 years later, I can say that being Lucan's mom is a grand adventure every single day. I followed my gut instinct again in November 2020 when I joined the inaugural Food Matters online nutrition certification program and became my own nutrition coach. I'd been having digestive issues and as a vegetarian had already given up coffee, alcohol and all other sugar and processed foods, but I was still, still feeling off. Over the next four months, I completed the 10 week self-paced nutrition program and determined that I had an intolerance to wheat and dairy. So I eliminated those from my diet, substituting in more plant-based proteins and flours like almond and cassava. I also did a four week 
soup and vegetable soup and juice detox. By the time my birthday rolled around on March 6, 2021, I'd not only resolved my digestive issues, but I was now a member of a very supportive wellness and nutrition community, and I had a new purpose. I also had soft, silky skin and abundance of energy, and I was three dress sizes smaller. It was inflammation, you see. And when I detoxed, my entire body shrank. So the moral of my story, of course, is that we should always, always follow our gut instinct. It's our guide, our compass, our North Star. And when we follow it without question, faithfully, even if the road looks dark and scary, we'll find our purpose, shine our brightest, and live our best lives. Thank you. Amazing, amazing, Karen. I loved it. Big applause for Karen. Yay! I know Facebook Live people, you're a little bit delayed, but you'll catch up and you'll give your applause and your comments. Karen, that was incredible. Um, I know your story well, and I thank you for being here and sharing it with us. Um, I love, I mean, everybody hears how like a lot of gurus out there talk about, you know, you got to get out of your head. If you're in your head, you're dead. You got to get out of your head and into your heart. Um, but it really sounds like in your case, and I, I know a lot of people, including myself, have experienced that gut feeling, right? So getting out of your head is where that the, the roommates and the inner critic live, but getting into your the trunk of your body, which would be your heart and those gut instincts. So um, and I really, really loved how uh, you talked about being brave and how people were, you know, during the adoption process going on about how, you know, you're so brave, but yet you were like, you didn't feel that way. You did not feel brave. And that I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that where you're going through something and others from the outside are looking in saying, wow, you guys are so brave. You're so courageous. You're so strong, but yet you yourself are not feeling that way, but you trusted that feeling in your gut and that's what helped you forge through. So that is a great lesson, a beautiful story, Karen. I thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, thank you so much, Karen. Next up, we have uh, the lovely Eleanor Sturko. Eleanor, oh, Eleanor, you're gonna help me, have to help me out with this because I forgot to ask you before. Eleanor is the author of can you please say this for um, me? It's called Paniyaluk. It's an Inuktitut ah. word that means way up there. Okay, so Eleanor is the author of Paniyaluk, The Tall One, Remembering Sergeant Dave Van Norman, a book she wrote to tribute her great uncle, who was a victim of the LGBT purge. Eleanor is also a member of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Her policing career has taken her across the country on many adventures from the RCMP musical ride in Ottawa to the shores of the Beaufort Sea. She is currently in charge of media relations for Canada's largest RCMP detachment in Surrey, BC. And when she's not on duty, Eleanor can often be found hiking the trails, especially, yeah, check out her Instagram, you'll see it, uh, or exploring the beaches with her spouse, Melissa, and their three children. With her talk, Red Surge, a thread that connects a family history. Here is Eleanor Sturko. Thanks, Karen. Um, it's great to see so many people uh, sharing these stories tonight. Uh, hi to my friends that I've had for some time and hello to all of you that I'm just meeting for the first time. Um, in 1964, Sergeant Dave Van Norman was forced to resign from the RCMP when they discovered that he was homosexual. And then 57 years later, an out lesbian, is the spokesperson for Canada's largest RCMP detachment. And as you heard in my wonderful intro, that spokesperson is me and Sergeant David Van Norman was my great uncle. So sadly, Dave passed away long before I became a member of the RCMP, but he was one of the reasons that I joined. 
And uh, he was part of what was known as the LGBT purge, which was a period that began in the 1950s, during which the Canadian government sought to fine and then expel LGBT people from the public service. They were labeled a threat to national security, uh, cast as subversives and likely targets for blackmail by communist regimes seeking classified information. And my uncle was devastated by his expulsion from the RCMP, but he really stayed proud of his service for his entire life. 27 years after his death, the government of Canada issued an apology for the purge. And my spouse, Melissa, and I got invited to attend the apology in Ottawa on behalf of Dave and my entire family. And I had received special permission to wear my red surge, which is the iconic uh, regimental uniform of the RCMP. Um, so we, uh, my wife and I went to Ottawa and attended a drill hall in front of us, row after row of metal chairs, perfectly aligned. Um, a podium stood silent with pride flags and the Canada flag. And we were sitting shoulder to shoulder with people who um, had been waiting for years, purge victims, uh, human rights advocates and family members. Who, they had been fighting for this apology. And I was the lone surge in the room. As the prime minister tearfully detailed the abuses of the purge and other acts of discrimination against the LGBT community, my wife, Melissa, reached down and grabbed my hand. Um, it, it was a very emotional time and she squeezed my hand, but I sat utterly stone-faced because I, I really didn't wanna show emotion in my surge. But then the prime minister started talking about the fruit machine and the fruit machine was a device that was procured by the RCMP as uh, a method of detecting homosexuals. So it was supposed to be based on pupil response. And the way that it would work was that they would show a subject a homoerotic image. And if their pupils reacted, then they were homosexual. And it was an RCMP sergeant that called it the fruit machine. But it was never used. The, the fruit machine was actually never used, but it has come to symbolize the type of investigations that were done during the purge. And as I heard the prime minister talk about that, I, I could feel tears starting to run down my cheeks. And I felt a feeling that I had never experienced in my uniform before. It was like just a terrible feeling uh, where I could feel almost like every eye in the room was burning a hole right through my scarlet tunic. And I realized that it was shame. Because as a family member of someone who was part of the purge, of course, I felt upset about what had been done like to my uncle, but now sitting there as a uniformed police officer, part of the RCMP, I felt ashamed about what we had done to other people. In that moment, I realized that some of the people for them in that room my uniform symbolized the discrimination that they had suffered in the purge. After the apology was over, I actually had several media inquiries and I had given some interviews and reporters would ask me, oh, how do you reconcile being a member of the RCMP with your family's history? And you know, I had a lot of different answers that I gave at that time. But the truth was, is that I actually hadn't reconciled it. Um, how could I? I? I mean, that realization that I had in the apology was something brand new for me. As a, a child, you know, during my childhood, what happened to Dave wasn't openly spoken about. And so what I knew about um, him and about the purge had come mostly from eavesdropping on hushed conversations of adults in my family. And what I had heard then was that Dave was out of the force because being gay was a crime and that homosexuality was shameful. But thankfully, the apology wasn't the end for me. It was actually a beginning because it really motivated me to learn more about what happened to Dave and also to learn more about the role of the RCMP in the purge. So I started to gather as much information as I could. And truthfully, the apology actually gave me courage to connect with my family. Um, and ask questions that I'd always been too afraid to ask. And it also connected me with other victims of the purge, people who had known Dave. And then over time, actually, people who saw me in the news, they began to call 
They wrote me emails and sent me letters. Um, many of them expressed their own feelings about the LGBT purge and you know, their own experiences. They too sought closure. They were seeking their own reconciliation. I actually remember one particular phone call was from uh, an RCMP veteran in his 80s. And um, he told me he didn't know my uncle, but he had seen me on the news. And he was mindful of another fellow that he actually knew who was a victim of the purge. And all these years he had carried with him so much regret that he hadn't done more, that he hadn't stood up for this fellow. But then just seeing me on the news, being accepted by the RCMP actually made him feel better. So every connection taught me more about the purge and helped me to heal and to reconcile. And my feelings of shame that I had felt over time started to be replaced by motivation and inspiration. And then I also found that through learning about all the historical injustice that I started to gain a greater appreciation of my circumstance today. I definitely accept that I can't change what's happened in our past, but I can control what happens in the future and I can help design what's happening in the future. I, we own this present today and together we can create what we want for the future. So today as a lesbian and a member of the RCP, I do share my family's story and what I've learned about discrimination in the LGBT community, but in also in others. Over the years, the culture of Canada has changed and the RCMP and what we believe about diversity and inclusion has also changed for the better. And my ability to reconcile came about as a result of the understanding, which came about because of those connections with people and, um, really compassion for our shared experience. So if you ask me again, how do I reconcile being an RCMP officer with my family's history, then I will tell you that it's by finding a way to carry on just like my uncle did. Because my family's history is my inspiration to be the police officer that I am today. And that's one that believes that all people must be treated with dignity and respect. So don't get stuck in shame. Seek to understand. I'll never change the past, but I strive to change the future. And hearing my family's story, I hope that you will too. Thank you guys so much for your time. Awesome. Amazing. Good job. Amazing. Wow. Proud to work with you, Al. That was beautiful, Eleanor. Um, Thanks I everybody. Yeah, I love that. Uh, I just love that story. It gets me every time. And, and I love that it just validates for us what we're doing here right now is telling stories. Because that that I remember when you first told me about that 80 year old man that saw you on the news that uh, that called you and, and, and was able to, you know, just feel good again and comfortable with how you're being treated by the RCMP because he was holding on his whole life this feeling and he could have went to the grave with that so um the idea of you know the fact that you opened up and you had that 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 strength and power to kind of persevere and and uh it's just amazing and and again like I said it's the reason why I even developed She Scapes Storytellers because I truly believe too that telling stories helps us connect people. It helps people um, have a greater understanding of other cultures and diverse backgrounds. Um, it's just, it's just amazing. And I know you've got many more stories to tell too. So you may be on a future episode as will some of the others. So anyways, thank you so much, Eleanor. That was beautiful.